In 2004, Hillcrest Labs created a new TV experience. Known today as the Smart TV, Hillcrest defined a holistic system design that included the remote control, human interaction, and the user interface that would provide access to the huge array of content available on TV today. Presented here with narration by Hillcrest founder and CEO Dan Simpkins is the original home interface. The design concepts and implementations provide a unique insight into the early days of interactive TV as well as highlight opportunities for new user experiences in the living room today. One of the most important parts of a television interface is the ability to configure the TV and the uh, TV controls in a, um, a really easy to use way. Um, probably the single biggest complaint that we heard from people that we were interviewing in preparation for the design of this platform is no one had to set, no one knew how to set up anything, no one knew how to configure anything, no one wanted to read the manuals, um, and so what people wound up doing is using only the most simplistic of um, most simplistic of capabilities on, on either their TVs or their cable boxes. Uh, so one of our uh, objectives of going to this visual platform was to make setting up and configuring uh, the platform easier. Um, one of the top applications, therefore, on the home screen is the settings application. When I zoom into settings, I now see a set of different kinds of functions. Now, this particular interface or, or this particular screen looks different than some of the other screens and part of the uh, reason for this is to show that there are a lot of ways to go about presenting visual um, visual information or cues about uh, what is available uh, to the user. Um, here we have these um, more or animated or, or, or graphical representations of the various controls and uh, some text that goes along with it. That's actually a, a fairly consistent uh, strategy. What we've used, if this was a movie screen, we might put the movie um, name below it, um, or a, an album, we might put uh, the album name below it, so that uh, you have an ability to get the precise um, textural representation of what it is that you're trying to do. Um, on this screen, we have eight uh, distinct uh, control uh, applications. And what we would normally do, uh, the last one here in the corner, it's, it's, it's to the bottom and, and right because uh, it's actually not something that is used uh, typically more than once. Um, but I think it would be appropriate to start with the setup wizard. We want to create an ability for people to set up this platform very easily. And so this uh, platform, which you know is called Home, uh, is designed to essentially be a a, uh, a software application that drives all of the entertainment content in, on the TV. If I start, it gives me opportunity to control the screen size. Um, at the time that we began designing home, um, more people had standard definition uh, television screens or what were called four by three screen um, aspect ratios versus the uh, currently popular and, and dominant 16 by nine uh, format. Uh, we'll, uh, we won't make a switch here. The interface is now set up for 16 by 9. But so once we've set the uh, size of the screen, um, we're also going to need to enter our zip code. Why? Because the system has to know what cable um, services exist in that particular region. Uh, this is uh, 20850 is the zip code of this particular locale, and we'll just leave that. We go next. Uh, there are actually two service providers. Um, either RCN or Comcast. We're going to stick with Comcast because that's our service provider. Uh, next, the system is going to download guide data for the Comcast service, and so we've done that. And uh, then we're going to go ahead and check to make sure that all of the uh, channel lineup is correct. And so the system is literally going to go through channel by channel and verify that each channel that you think is actually the channel that's playing. Um, that's an important part of this verification process. Um, and then finally, when that's all done, we basically um, essentially uh, conclude and we, um, we set up for op normal operation. So we won't go through that, that full process. We're going to jump out of this. 
Um, so now we've set up our system and we're ready to go. Um, we could also go and set the um, some of these uh, features or some services independent of the setup wizard. You might want to change uh, later. You might have a standard definition TV and then you decided um, that you talked your uh, wife into buying you a nice new shiny widescreen TV for Christmas and you're going to switch to widescreen. So it's possible to go back and make that change. Um, channel lineup, same thing. You might uh, be using Comcast today but make a switch to RCN tomorrow and again you have the opportunity uh, to go in and make those changes. So you see you can enter a zip code and have it auto select. You can go in and, and select from a list and you can actually verify um, your lineup much like the uh, wizard allowed you to do. Um, in recordings, there are some important um, parameters that you want to set for your DVR. Now, what we were showing previously, if you look at each of these applications, you see a visual selection where I can literally click on the screen type and highlight it and make that selection. All right? In channel lineup, I have ways of typing zip codes, I'm using tabs, I'm using radio buttons or are called uh, selection buttons. Um, in this case, they're square with check marks. And um, I have this verification process so that again uses way. actually live video um, in this in the um, right in now, this particular screen, so coupled with so um, a channel lineup. <laughs> and, um, in the recordings, I use this idea of a scroll function because here um, I could click. Um, or I could use the scroll wheel and go through a longer selection list. And so I have a more than one way to do this. One of the philosophies of the home design was that you should always have two ways to approach more complicated um, you know, interface uh, approaches or interface problems. Um, the simple way, what I'll call the more intuitive way that anybody can figure out and maybe the more complicated way or sophisticated or efficient way that an expert might use the system. In this case, I highlight the number, so that was important to know, so it's yellow, and I scroll. Over here, I'm scrolling the wheel now and nothing's happening. So it's an important interaction um, concept. But I could always just go to the arrows very intuitively and click up and down. Um, here in DVR settings, we have the maximum episodes that you could store in the system uh, for, a given, uh, for a given sequence, or um, if you have the series recording, uh, you, you might want to limit the number of episodes uh, to minimize the amount of hard drive space you're going to use. Uh, you also have parameters to set how many minutes before or after a show is scheduled to be on uh, to account for shows that might run over their uh, 30 or 60 minute um, normal boundaries. A perfect example of that is a sports um, event, a, um, a, you know, a, a game that is certainly going to likely run over, um, or a live event or an interview, uh, potentially a news conference that you suspect might run over the scheduled time, in which case you'd want to give yourself a little bit of buffer on your DVR recording. There are certainly other parameters that you might be able to set. What we're doing here is just giving examples um, that are reasonable examples of what, um, what one might do to set up a platform like this. Now, parental controls. This is a great example of where the point and click interface can make a very big difference. Um, traditionally, uh, parental controls are hard to configure. And what we wanted to do is really simplify that process. So if I go into parental controls, I go into parental controls, and um, you see three tabs. I have a general setup. I can set parental controls by ratings, and I can set it by channel. And this is important. So to start with, in order to configure parental controls, you have to create a pin. Um, so we're going to enable parental controls, and we're going to set the pin 1, 1, 1, 1. 
and then we have it, and you notice that it entered the number and then went to uh, the dash. Now, this is on television, so clearly one of the things that we did is study this process quite a bit. This is the most simplistic uh, mechanism to create a PIN number, and it's not super secure. There are other methods that use random sequences or um, grids that have more than one number in them um, in order to both enter the PIN number after you've made the selection or select um, or go through a, a more secure process of selecting. It's assumed that when you do this, you do this in private. So we're going to accept that. It's going to ask us to re-enter. This time I'm going to use my scroll function to select it. I'm going to accept that. And now I've got a parental control. Now when I go by rating, I've entered my, uh, my PIN number. I'm sorry, now you have a PIN number. I, I'm entering that PIN number. And it gives me the ability to choose the highest level of, um, of rating that I would accept. So if I want um, to limit anything above PG-13 or PG, I can just simply click. It'll blank out um, any of that. And again, on moving ratings, if I want nothing above uh, PG, I can do the same thing, and I only accept a G rating. Um, I could unrate. I could go um, lock anything that's unrated, or I can frankly reset and unlock everything. So you see a very flexible way to do this. I can also, with a simple check, hide all adult content. Um, makes it easy. Where this really gets uh, nice is I've got a large channel lineup. I could have hundreds of channels, and if I want to go in and I know that there's uh, HBO is a, a particular channel uh, that I don't want um, the kids to be able to watch, I can simply go in and make a single uh, selection and lock a single channel um, and do that on a selective basis. So very important, and then I can, I can unlock everything. So ratings and parental controls really nice um, interface using this point-and-click strategy. Games. So when we developed this uh, platform, one of the things that was critically important to us was to showcase the kinds of applications that you would be able to, uh, to implement, to, to, uh, to use on a television. We have this large screen, um, and one of the nice things about the large screen was that we could move the kinds of games that people were playing on the PC with a high resolution screen like uh, the card game Solitaire or free and Free Cell, but we could also add the kinds of dynamic motion games um, that would really expand the horizons with this kind of platform. Um, the nice thing about free space is it's high performance, it's uh, got precision, um, and it would allow you to use um, to create time-based games uh, that were a lot more fun and um, engaging. So in a sense, it became a cross between uh, the PC platform and the uh, casual gaming that people often played like uh, the card games um, and the type of very rich uh, dynamic motion games that existed in the, um, the console world. So here we have a game that in a sense is a, a point and click game. What we did was we made this game, um, a, a, again a time based game. You have 20 seconds to hit as many of these uh, cute little gophers um, as, that you, as you could find. And what was interesting with this game is once we brought this game to the uh, platform, we found out that indeed the game served a second purpose. The game was an excellent training tool. It, it's modeled after essentially a fits test, random targets on the screen um, that you had to dynamically hit as fast as possible to get the highest score. And when we started this, we would find that people would kind of take their time. They wouldn't really have the control of the, of the cursor. Uh, they wouldn't know how to use the device. And they would wind up with a moderately low score, generally a score somewhat in the, the low 100s. And, um, and so what we would say to somebody was, OK, you were very conscious of the pointer. Now let's become unconscious. Let's actually focus on the game itself and try to increase your score. And lo and behold, what we found is um, that because the device was uh, particularly 
um, instinctive, it was an intuitive to use, um, people would start to focus on the game itself and stop focusing on the screen and the device. Um, and the result was that over the course of this uh, 20 second period, they would raise their score typically from those low 100s to the, the mid 200s or, or beyond. And once they went through that process, um, they, were, they were trained. So not only did we create an environment where pointing and a dynamic, very um, instinctive, intuitive, and easy to use pointer could be brought onto the screen to be used in a gaming environment um, where we could take games that were random, that would require random access um, and move them from the PC world uh, to the television.